All right. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. Let's say I'm honored to stand behind this holy desk and preach for our pastor this morning. Never take it lightly when he asks me. So, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 11, starting there, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a, a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I want to preach to you this morning a message titled, When You Face the Fire. When you face the fire. We will pray and we will get into this. Father, we love you and Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, preach the word of God this morning. Lord, I pray I would only say that which you would have me to say. And Father, I ask you to soften every heart in here. And I pray everybody would take the message very seriously. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would have free reign today and that you would do a mighty work in hearts. And Father, I pray for the soul that is closest to hell this morning. I pray that they would take the message very seriously and they would trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and receive eternal life today. May today be the day of their salvation. We just ask you to bless and Lord, just help us to have a great time in church. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. All right. Fire is found all throughout the Bible. And I want to thank my wife for singing that song. Perfect song for this, the refiner's fire. And we are going to get into that this morning. But God uses fire in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways uh, in, the, in the word of God. And so by uh, introduction this morning, I want to talk about, first of all, how God uses fire, how God uses fire fire. And number one, he uses it to cleanse, to cleanse. You ever see on TV or maybe a, um, a, a, a documentary where you see a forest fire and though it looks terrifying and horrible, it's actually really very healthy for the forest as it burns away all the underbrush and it takes all the, all the rotten stuff out of there and it creates an environment where new growth can be stimulated and it's an, it's an improvement for the habitat and all of the wildlife. It's a good thing. That cleansing fire is a good thing. But as we go through this, I want to make this statement. No matter how good the fire is, it always burns. Hurts. Fire burns. It doesn't matter if it's a house fire and you run in and you're trying to save a family member or get some stuff out, it'll burn you. Or if you're gathered around a campfire and you're cooking marshmallows, and that's just a nice warm fire, you're just having a great time. If you stick your hand in there, you know what it's going to do? Burn. Good fires and bad fires, they all burn. Number two, God uses fire to destroy. In uh, Genesis chapter 19, we read how God sent brimstone and fire on Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy them because of their sin. God uses fire to destroy Number three, he uses it for sacrifice. And we read uh, in uh, Genesis 22 how um, Abraham had the wood and he had, he had everything for the burnt offering, but he didn't have the sacrifice. And he knew God would provide one. And he provides that ram in, in the uh, thicket and he provides a burnt sacrifice. And number four, he, he uses it to shine light. And I want everyone to turn over to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 And verse 21, well, yeah, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of the cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. God uses fire to shine light. And a lot of times when God uses fire to shine light in our lives, 
and reveal the sin in our lives or to reveal the path that God wants us to take, it's not always a good feeling. It might go against the flesh. It might go against what, what we want to do. We might not want to give up our sin. But over in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, I want to read this word for word here. He says that, is not my word uh, like as a fire and a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? God compares his word to a fire. And when we read the word of God and we study the word of God, or we sit under the preaching of God's word, God is able to shine light into the darkness. He's able to use that fire of his word to shine light into your heart and to reveal sin and to reveal wickedness and to show you what he wants you to get out of his life, or excuse me, out of your life, and to show you what you need to bring in. He uses fire. He uses the fire of his word to shine light. Now, let me ask you this. Are you reading the word of God? Because if you're not, how are you getting light? We can talk about how great the Bible is and how great it is to read and study God's word and how much we love God's word. And everybody in here would say, man, amen. That's right, preacher. I love God's word. I love hearing the preaching of God's word. But how often do you take time and get away by yourself and you open it up and you let the fire of God's word shine into your heart and into your life. It's easy to sit in Calvary Baptist Church, probably the easiest place on earth to sit and say, I love God's word. But when you're home by yourself, you wake up in the morning, before you get going, before you do everything else, do you let the fire of God's word shine into your light? Psalm, Psalm 119, 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How are we supposed to know where God wants us to go if we never give him a chance to tell us? People always say, Brother Payne, I don't, I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. Brother Bell, I don't know what God wants. Pastor, I don't know what God wants. Have you opened up the word? Let his word shine light? You're in a, you're in a tough situation. You go to all your friends, you call your family members, you get on Facebook and you chat online with folks. What should I do? And you never take time to open up the fire of God's word and let it reveal that light and what God wants you to do. Number five, God uses fire to punish. To punish. Revelation uh, chapter 20 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. God uses fire to punish. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about hell. Every lost person on this planet, who, when they draw their, their last breath, will be punished in hell, in fire, for all of eternity. And lastly, number six, he uses fire to show himself. I love reading the portion of scripture over in Exodus where Moses is talking to the burning bush. And that bush is on fire, yet it's not being destroyed. It's not being burnt up. And the Bible says, both in Deuteronomy and Hebrews, that God is a consuming fire. He uses fire to describe himself. I love that. Fire shines light. Fire cleanses. Fire destroys. As a matter of fact, fire changes everything that it touches. It changes everything that it touches. And when God puts you through a fire in your life, you better believe in one way, shape, or form, you're going to come out changed. But you have to go through it properly to come out changed the right way. Just because you're in a fire doesn't mean that you will come out on the other side the way God wants you to be. And that's really what the focus of this message is this morning. Because when you're a Christian, when you're saved... There's two types of fires we go through. We go through the ones that we set for ourselves. We get ourselves in messes. We, we, we put ourselves through fires. But then there's the ones that God designs very specifically for your life and for my life. Because God is trying to mold us and to make us into something greater than what we are. And God knows us. He knows his plan. And he knows what he's preparing us for. And so he will very delicately design a fire for you to go through that might be different than the one I have to go through. And he's trying to mold you and to make you into the best servant that you could ever be for him. And that's hard because the fire burns. And when you're in pain, when something isn't right, all you want to do is get away from that pain. But what God asks us to do is to trust him, to take a step back and be still and let him do his work. Because sometimes the fire is short-lived. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes God asks his children to go through really difficult hard, hot fires 
in order for him to be able to prepare you for what he has for your life. And before we get into this, I want to tell you that, remember, every time you come down here to, to this altar, you say, God, use me. God, change me. God, help me to get this out of my life. You are inviting the fire into your life. Remember that. And then when you come up the next day, why did I have such a bad day? Well, what would you pray yesterday? You said, God, get this out of my life. He's not going to just remove something out of your life magically. He's going to put you through the fire. He's going to remove it the right way. So the fires that we will face, I have five fires here that we will face as born-again believers. Well, excuse me, four of them that we will face as born-again believers of God. And I want everyone to turn over to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the, unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Number one, we will face a filtering fire. A filtering fire. Boy, the Bible says that God is like a refiner's fire. If you don't know what that is, it simply means that you take a blacksmith or somebody working with metal and they take the metal and they melt it uh, down and the dross, all the impurities will float to the top. And they're able to take a, a spoon of some sort and to just scrape all, that, all the impurities off of the metal. And they'll do that sometimes several times to get it all out. And what it does is it allows the metal to become purer cleaner and more valuable and stronger. It's a more pure metal. If you want pure aluminum or pure steel or pure whatever, you have to melt it down and get all that junk out. And God wants to take you through a fire sometimes and me through a fire sometimes to get all the junk out. Because you can't live in this world and not have junk in your life. You face it every time you walk out the door. You face it every time you look at your phone. You face it every time you talk to somebody. There's junk everywhere. And our lives get so filled with junk and sin. And the Bible in Hebrews 12 says, let us lay aside the, uh, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And we come down here and we beg God to, to, to transform us and to mold us into a Christian that he can use for his glory and his honor and his work. Lord, help me to be a, a, a soul winner. Help me to say no to sin. Well, he has to put us through the fire and scrape that stuff out because I have found, at least in my life, Maybe you all are a whole lot more spiritual than me, but in my life, I tend to not just get rid of the junk. If it's something I like, it might just tend to sit there. And then sometimes God has to come through with a fire and remove it. And that fire could be a trial, some, some sort of heartache. That fire could be the preaching of God's word. You might be sitting here today and God's already brought something to your mind. That's a fire right there. And he's, the Holy Spirit of God is just pounding your heart, telling you, you've got to get rid of that. He's trying to filter things out. That might come in the form of, of, of you just getting up in the morning and opening up the word of God and reading. And God uses the fire of his word to reveal something. And you say, oh, Lord, you're, you're right. And sometimes the fire starts out low and we keep saying no. So then God just cranks up the heat and cranks up the heat. And I'm going to go ahead and just tell you this. He wins that battle every time. He wins that battle every time because he can, he can take the heat. We can't take the heat. I mean, when the fire gets going hot and heavy and you're in a trial and you know exactly what God is telling you to get out of your life. And all you got to do is say, all right, Lord, I'm done with that. And then... Anybody ever experienced that? You've just kind of said no, no, no. Then all of a sudden you say yes. And there's just this peace, like you're in a waterfall. You were, you were on fire, you just got in the water. Oh, you feel so good. And God's trying to do something. He's trying to filter wickedness and sin out of your life. Can I just tell you something? Let him do it. Don't come down here and say you want to be a great Christian and you want to love God and you want to serve him, but then be upset when he's trying to remove all the ungodliness out of your life. And it says in um, uh, uh, Hebrews uh, 12, it says the weights and the sin. He might be trying to pull something out of your life that might not be a sin, but it might just be something you just don't need. It's, it's consuming too much of your time. You don't read God's word because you're involved in this thing over here. Some sort of 
some sort of game, some sort of friend group, some sort of whatever it is. And he's like, you know, this isn't sinful, but it's, it's taking you away from me. And, and I've got a work over here for you to do, and you, you're going to be great at it. But you can't do it because you're too busy with this. And though there might not be scripture and verse that says, thou shalt not do this, God's saying, let's get that out of your life. You don't need it. It's fruitless. It's vain. I'm going to take you over here and use you over here. And so if you're going to be used by God, understand this. You cannot be used by God and never go through a fire. Impossible. You read the men, how God used the greatest men in the word of God. They all went through the fire. Some of them went through crazy fires. Number two is a fashioning fire. I like this one. Staying in the same verse, talking about that refiner's fire. Anybody ever seen a blacksmith in person? Yeah, yeah that's neat. Yeah, you, they go and they, and they take the piece of metal and they put it in the fire and they start to take hammers and tools and what looks like, they're, like it starts out, oh, they're just hitting a, a red hot piece of metal with some hammers. But when they're done, they have a tool or a knife that has been built and created and made strong for a very specific purpose. Right. 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 It's amazing to see it. My son, somebody in here gave my son a knife made out of a rail spike. Got a nice twist in it. I could have never done that in a million years. But I mean, it is sharp, it's shiny, it's beautiful. Started as a nail spike and a blacksmith, a master blacksmith took that thing and put it in the fire and hit it and used other tools to create it or to uh, transform it from a, a rail spike into a beautiful knife, a sharp knife that now has a purpose other than what it was before. You see, before you, you got saved, you had a different purpose. Your purpose was to live for self. Your purpose was to live for sin and the world. Now you've been saved. God has brought you out of that life, and he's trying to mold you and make you into a tool for a very specific reason. And like I said before, the reason or the will that God has for your life may be very different than what he has for my life. And so the, the fire that is designed for you may be different than mine. But what he's trying to do is he puts you in a fire to, to mold you and to make you into a tool that he can use. If God's called you to be a missionary, he might have a, a specific fire for you to go through, for you to learn how to, how to work that work. If God wants you to be a preacher, and you were somebody like me, who went, and I, I said it in Sunday school this morning, the last thing I ever wanted to do when I left school, ever in my life, was to stand before any people and talk. Now I stand before people and talk all of the time. Because God's will was different than mine. But you want to know what? When I first started preaching and teaching in front of people, it was ugly. God had to do some molding and some making and to make me into a little bit better than what I was. But here's the problem. When we fight God in the fire, we're moldable. And when you fight in the fire, you come out disfigured and deformed, not the tool that God designed. And so now he cannot use you for the purpose that he was trying to create you to be used for. He can't use you over here because you fought in the fire. You didn't come out the tool that God was supposed to, to have. You didn't come out surrendered. You didn't come out full of faith. You didn't come out sharpened and ready with your mind focused. No, you fought the whole time and now you're disfigured and you're deformed. You're unusable. Because when God was trying to mold you and make you after you came down here or you were in your home and you said, God, use me. Use me for something greater. Help me to be a witness. Help me to trust you. You fought and you fought and you fought when he was trying to make you what you asked him to make you. And now you're disfigured and, dis and you're deformed and he cannot use you for that purpose. And he's going, oh, just a few more days and I would have had you out of that fire and you would have been over here serving me, but now you're all deformed. And so you know what he has to do now? He has to put you back in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go right back in. Cycle after cycle after cycle. Sometimes when people uh, come up to me, just always in the same fire, I just wonder often, are you just saying no over and over and over? Are you fighting constantly, constantly fighting God? Stop fighting God. Let him mold you into the tool, the man, the woman that he wants you to be so you can go forth and serve him all the days of your life. And then later on in life, when he wants to do for or uh, uh, use you somewhere else, he might have another little fire over here for you. But that's where we get into number three, a faith-building fire. 
a faith building fire. I want everyone to go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter one and verse six, the Bible says that wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. A faith building fire. Faith, though it be tried with fire. Um when you go through a fire properly, it'll build your faith. It's hard in the midst of the fire. And listen to me, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's always just super easy to trust God when you're going through a fire, a hard time, because it's not. I'd be lying to tell you that. That's where faith comes in. And that's how the fire builds faith. When you're in a fire, when you're in a hard time, when God's asking you to do something that seems impossible, whatever it is, and you decide no matter how much it burns, no uh, no matter how much it hurts, I'm going to trust God. When you get through that fire, your faith will be strengthened. And the next time a fire comes along, you'll be able to look back and say, you know what? God brought me through that last one. God brought me through that last one. Lord, I don't want to go in this fire because I've been through them before. I know they burn. I know it's going to change me. I'm scared. I, but Lord, I know I can trust you because I've trusted you before. And I trusted you in that fire before that. And I've trusted you in that fire before that. It doesn't get easier to go through the fire. It just gets easier to trust them. After you trust them over and over and over again. And you find out that the Bible is true when it says he will, uh, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee, right. especially not in the fire. He didn't bring you to the fire to turn tail and run. He didn't put you in the fire just to torture you and just to laugh at you while you're in pain. He brought you to the fire for a reason. And he's going to go through that fire with you. Cling to him. Trust him. I, I, imagine, Dan, uh, you know, everyone... Everyone go to uh, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 23. The Bible says, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the, burning, of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astoined and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. These three men knew they were about to be thrown into a fire. And they knew God was going to to be with them. I don't think they knew God was going to be with them like this. I don't know that they could have ever looked ahead and known, we're going to be cast into a literal fire, a really, really hot fire, so hot that it was burning up the people around them outside the fire. And they trusted God knowing they were likely going to die. They said, that's fine. We'll just go ahead and die. They trusted God. Whether they were going to live or die, they trusted that God's will would be done and God was going to allow to happen what he wanted to happen. And they got thrown into that fire and lo and behold, it was better than they could have ever imagined. Getting into the fire, being thrown into it was probably terrifying. So they landed on the ground and realized Jesus is here. He's going to bring us out. And the Bible says when they came out of that fire, there wasn't even the smell of smoke upon them. But you want to know what? They never would have had this experience. We would have never had this in the word of God had they not trusted God and had been willing to be thrown into that fire. Knowing the likelihood was death for them. We never would have had this in scripture, but they trusted God. What is it that you're not trusting God with today? 
What is it that you keep fighting God with and you're just having such a hard time letting go? What fire are you in right now that, that uh, God is just trying to build that faith? He's trying to show you it's okay to trust me. And I'm going to be honest, God typically doesn't do things the way I want him to do it. When I am trusting God for something, he typically doesn't come through exactly the way I would have put it on pen and paper. Sometimes I wish I could say, here, God, if you're going to come through with, uh, for me in this, this is how I'd like you to do it. If, you know, you step by step, I would really, really appreciate it. And God just goes, yeah, okay. Yeah. He's like, yeah, you know what? I got my, oh, I can't even tear that other one. I got my own plan. I have something I want to do. I'm going to do it my own way because I'm going to get the glory for it. And that's the other thing you have to remember. When you're trusting God through a fire, he gets the glory. He gets the glory. Amen. And people come, can uh, come by you and say, man, you're, you're going through such a hard time. Why are you still faithful? Why do you still have a pep in your step? Why are you still in love with God? Because he's faithful and I'm going to give him the glory. When I come through it, you'll see why. You will see why. Let God build your faith. But don't come down here and pray for God to build you and God to mold you and God to make you and then get angry with him and storm out of here and he puts you in the fire. He's doing exactly what you asked him to do. He's simply being faithful and answering your prayer. He's just doing it in a way you probably don't want him to do it. But I'm going to tell you this, your faith, your faith will never build. You will never trust God more until you've been through a fire. You will not. Number four, the final fire. I want everyone to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I say the final fire. It's the final fire for those of us who were saved. But I think maybe this fire is a little bit more important and a little bit more terrifying than we'd all like to believe. Going back to chapter 3, verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work, listen to this, shall be made manifest, which means known, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And it's easy to kind of cast that off. Oh, it's so far away, the judgment seat of, of Christ, when, I'm, when all my works are being judged and are put through the fire. But I think on that day, it's going to be a much bigger deal than what we think it is. Right, I'm sure it is. And what it says here is that our works will be tried. Our sins are forgiven, washed clean. We're good there. Amen. Praise God. But our works will be tried by the fire. And I want you to think about this, because I don't have to stand before God and answer for any of your works. I don't have to answer for Pastor Shiplett's works. I have to answer for mine. And it says that it's going to be put through the fire. I want everyone right now to just take a, a quick tour through your life. And I want you to look at your intentions, the reasons that you're doing things, the reasons that you serve God. Are you looking for applause? Are you looking for men's applause? Are you doing things out of pride and arrogance? Are you doing things to just have a better name about yourself around here? Why do you serve God? Whatever it is you do, why do you do it? Why do you go out soul winning for those that go? Do you go out soul winning simply so pastor doesn't come up to you and say, why don't I ever see what's soul winning? It's not the reason to go soul winning. Do you teach a Sunday school simply because it's just a duty to you? Are you kind and loving towards people, but two-faced about it? Come on, come on. Kind and nice and loving to their face and turn around and just tear them down with your words? If you have a job around here, whether it's vacuuming the floor, cleaning the bathrooms, getting things ready for the church services, you do it with the right heart, right motives, right uh, desires. All of those things will be tried by the fire. And you can fool me all day. You can fold these men up here and everybody in this church all day, but when you and I stand before God and our works are tried by that fire, the truth will be revealed. And it says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Amen. But you know, I'd love to have something to throw back at yeah. the feet of my Savior. Yeah. I want treasures and crowns to cast 
at the feet of Jesus Christ. He is worthy of that. He is worthy of you and I to serve him properly with the right attitudes, with the right motives, to serve him simply because we love him. He died on Calvary's cross, gave his life, shed his blood, suffered unspeakable torment so we could have heaven, and so many Christians do absolutely nothing for God, and then a lot, a very large percentage of those that do things for God do it with wrong intentions and wrong motives, and you might be able to fool us, but it will be revealed by fire one day. One day, you'll, you'll have to answer not to me, not to pastor, but to God for that. You have to answer to God for why, why did you serve me with the wrong attitude? Why did you say you love people, but you didn't? Why did you get up and preach and teach a Sunday at school, but you only did it so people would come up to you and say, oh, great job, great job. You've, you, you have your reward. You have your reward. Your intentions, your motives, the reasons that you serve God will all be made known. I don't think we have any idea, any idea how horrible it's going to be watching our works burn up. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I've got works that will burn up. I know I do. I'd be a liar to say that. How hard it's going to be to watch some of the things I did for Christ be made known, manifest to all that it wasn't really for Christ. It burnt up. It wasn't, it wasn't really for him. No. Look at your life. Be honest with yourself and ask yourself, why do I do? Why do I do what I do? Why do I teach that class? Why do I clean that bathroom? If it's not because you don't love God and just want to serve him, it's the wrong reason. And that work will burn it will be tried by fire. It's going to be an important day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And maybe you've been doing things for the wrong reason. Fine. Start today doing them for the right reason. Serve God because he's God. No pride, no arrogance, no false motives. Serve God because he's God. And I want everyone to go over to Luke chapter 16. Those of us who are saved, those are some of the fires we might have to face one day. But if you're not saved, I want to tell you that number five, there's a forever fire that you will have to face. A forever fire. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared uh, sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named uh, Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was, and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And, uh, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest good, uh, thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and, comforted, and thou art tormented. A forever fire. Those of you who are lost, those of you who are not saved, you've either refused the gift of Christ or you, maybe you've never heard it and this is the first time. Anybody who dies without Jesus Christ faces a forever fire. And I want to tell you something. Once you face that fire for one second, that's it. You'll face that fire for all of eternity. Think about that. All of eternity. And what's sad is so many people will have come to this church and sat here and listened to the gospel preached time and time again. They will refuse Christ, die, and end up in hell. And in the uh, book of Mark, chapter 9, three times it says, Hell was a place where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. The fire is never quenched in hell. And it says, Where their worm dieth not. And I believe that means they'll be tormented by a lot of, a lot of different things, but one of those things that they'll be tormented in is their, their memory of this. Yes. 
tormented. Every time you had an opportunity to be saved, you'll be tormented time and time and time again, remembering the opportunity you had to trust Christ, and you refused, and you rejected, and you will be tormented by that day and night for all of eternity. Hell was a very real place. The fires that we experience as Christians are temporary. We get to go to heaven. One day our faith won't have to be built because our faith will end in sight. Amen? One day, God won't have to mold us and make us into the tool that he needs us to be. Because we'll be perfect. One day those things won't, won't ever happen to us again. Those fires will be quenched and, and done. But all of you in here or around the world who refuse Jesus Christ, your fire will never end. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says everybody, every single person that has ever lived is a sinner. You've broken God's law. You and I deserve this place called hell. We deserve it. But God in his love toward us sent his son Jesus Christ, who was perfect in every way, God in the flesh, to live a perfect life on this earth for 33 and a half years and then willingly give his life on that cross. He was beaten, spit upon, the crown of thorns put upon his head nailed to a cross. We get so used to hearing that. I wonder if anybody could even stomach watching a human being be nailed to a cross. To be whipped with a cat of nine tails. Have your back ripped open. Have the crown of thorns smashed into your, into your brow to be, and then to spit on that person. It'd be terrible to watch anybody go through that. Much less the son of God who willingly did that to pay for my sin and your sin. Then he died on that cross. He was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead, defeating death, defeating hell, and sealing salvation for all who would call upon his name, admitting that they were sinners and that they needed a Savior and that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, that his death, burial, and resurrection is the only way to heaven. You put your faith in him and call upon him. Jesus says, I will in no wise cast you out. Amen. Amen. But if you refuse it, you will face a fire that will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And there isn't a soul in here who can even begin to understand what that is. All of us have lived, even the oldest person in here, has, your life is but a vapor. In the, it's a blip in the face of eternity. And you might say, oh, God would never do that to me. Okay, you, you just go ahead and take that chance. But why would you? Jesus Christ gave his life, gave everything so that you and I could have a home in heaven, be forgiven of all of our sins, and then live for him for the rest of our life, telling others what Christ has done in our life. So I'm going to tell you this morning, whether you're saved or lost, you're going to face fires. Nobody gets out of here unscathed. If, you're, if, you are, if you are really serious about serving God, you are going to face fires and you're going to have to buckle down and understand how to go through them, get through them properly, let God mold you and make you into who he wants you to be and get through the fire so you can get back to work. So you can serve him. But if you're going to refuse him, you will face a different fire. And that fire will never, ever, ever mold you and make you into anything else. You will suffer and be in torment for all of, all of eternity. So I'm going to ask you this question. Brother Payne can go ahead and, and get ready here. When you face the fires, okay, what are you going to do? When you face that filtering fire, God's trying to take something out of your life. Or you face that fashioning fire where he's trying to mold you into something new. Or that faith building fire when he's just trying to get you to, to lean on him and trust him more. What are you going to do? Are you going to complain and whine and fight and run and leave and quit? Or are you going to be still and let God do his work and trust him to get you through it? And those of you who are lost today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you have something that you need to pray about, the altar is absolutely open, please. But I'm going to talk to the lost people in here today. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what I said is true. 
You can watch all the YouTube videos about people arguing, arguing about hell being real. It doesn't change the fact that hell is real. If you say, Brother Frank, I'm not saved. I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But today, today, I want to trust Christ and get saved. Raise your hand. I'm the only one looking around. Raise your hand. Anyone like that? Say, Brother Frank, I need to get saved. I see one over there. Amen. Would there be another that said, Brother Frank, I need to get saved. I don't want to spend an eternity in hell. Anyone like that? Slip up your hand. Amen. Well, there may be some more in here. He said, Brother Frank, I know some fires are coming. Maybe I'm in one right now, and I just need to get through it properly. Anyone else like that? Amen. It's important to get through these things properly. Let God do a mighty work in your heart.